next up we have Glenn Stewart from the National Circus, so the National Circus in the UK. Um, someone we've connected with, we've experienced some of his coaching and uh, his expertise and he's gonna bring, there's gonna be a practical element to uh, this one as well. So make sure you've got something to juggle. We're gonna look at some skill development work and looking at some juggling examples. Here we go. How are we doing, mate? Hey, buddy, good. Good to see you. Can you hear me? Yeah, we're all good, we're all good, we're all good. Um, yeah, I just gave, I haven't done like a full introduction yet. Um, I was just going to uh, set, the tone, set the tone a little bit. Um, and, uh, hey, and then we can... Hey, see buddy, good. Yeah. Good to see you. Okay, I'm just uh, not sure whether you're on yeah. the computer or on the... We're all good, we're all good. Oh, um, hang on, maybe yeah, I've got to X the computer I idea. Hang on. Okay, Sorry, I was just trying right. to figure out... There was some double action going on. How are we doing? So, yeah, um, good. For people, for people watching, um, the idea with the podcast live is to make this as interactive as possible. Um, so we've getting together um, some of the favourite guests we've had on the podcast. Um, Glenn works at the National Circus. We'll get into a little bit of that in a second. Um, but just if you've got any specific questions, ask those in the comments. We're also going to have a practical element where we're going to look at some... Um, skill development and using the uh, juggling as a tool to uh, bring that to life. So as a practical element to today's and any specific questions um, that you've got, put them in the comments. It's then uh, my job to try and keep an eye on those and I'll ask those as we, as we go through. But um, Glenn, welcome to uh, the podcast live today. Thanks for having, uh, well, thanks for joining us again. We've, um, you know, we've been down a, a few times, uh, myself and Tim, to the National Circus to visit you there. We were, when we had the first opportunity, the invite to come down to the National Circus, it was like, yes, we we're going to go to the circus. Like, we were so excited. The idea of the vast um, array of different athletes, different skills and different things that you teach was so interesting to us. And um, we, yeah, we were really excited about coming and learning learning from you. For those that, um, you know, maybe don't know your background, just sort of uh, briefly, you've got a, personally a gymnastics background yourself. Um, yeah. And then how long have you been, how long have you been at the National Circus? And what's your sort of, what do you, what do you, do you just a bit of context people, what you, what you do there? Sure. Well, thanks for having me on again. Uh, yeah, it's been great. I've always think the stuff that you guys are doing is phenomenal. And today, I mean, I've jumped in and out and various people you've had in. I think the quality of guests is phenomenal. So just being a consumer of what you guys have put together today. Right, it's just um, gone up a notch with you on again, buddy. I was going to say, it's good to tear the whole thing down. But, uh, okay, so, um, yeah, as you said, I, I sort of had a, a, a gymnastics background. I, um, I was born and raised in, in New Zealand, so I was in the gymnastics scene there which, uh, you know, and on the international scene, we're sort of pretty much down the picking order a bit. So it was a, a very enjoyable sort of um, sport for me to be partaking probably from about the age of eight to about 20. Uh, and, of course, had a, had a, you know, it's a great base, I think, for all the stuff that we start looking at, at now. Um, I sort of got into coaching gymnastics uh, as I was sort of getting towards the end of my own sort of competing um, while I was at university and what was sort of interesting about it is okay we had the sort of the competitive squad and the young sort of you know athletes there but we also had all the recreational stuff and if I'm really honest the most useful part of probably what I use nowadays was working with the kids um, how do you keep it engaging how do you keep it fun how do you you know playful and all those things which actually now full circle later back in the circus world those are all the things that are really valuable um, so I came over to the UK in 1999, so nearly 21 years ago, I guess, 20 odd years ago. Um, and initially was sort of looking to move away from working with kids because I'd done that for quite a while. Um, and actually what was interesting is that there was a huge pull for adults wanting to do gymnastics. And, you know, at that time, to be fair, I was in the mindset, look, if you hadn't started this game by the time you're 10 years old, you're, you're, you're out of the picture. Yeah. And, and of course, yes, in some ways, if you want to be an Olympian, then it's... Yeah going to be tough but it was amazing to see the amount of people that were choosing this as a recreational activity after their day at the office well I and think this kind so just to something interesting i think that that's one of the that's one of the really interesting things that me and tim found ourselves of, of this our own sort of organic journey to to doing calisthenics but at the end of the day like it's all movement and it's lots of these things have similar um 
elements. And if you just take the handstand as one example, like it wasn't uh, the idea of coming out of like coming out of rugby and trying to do something a bit different, and the idea of um, going to like a formal organised gymnastics scene really seems like oh, like for a number of different reasons. One, too hard. Two, I ain't got the lycra. <laughs> Three, like. I don't know, it was just so many different, it just didn't, it wasn't a place that was, um, it wasn't a place that we felt like we could gravitate towards to, because I think, as you said, you feel that unless you were doing it when you're six, seven, eight years old, you, you, you're miles away. So um, I guess it's opened the door for all these different movement options and calisthenics being one of those that's been born. It seems like, depends who you follow on Instagram, obviously we follow the very similar types of people that, it seems like everyone, everyone, once they're an adult, is once you're once you're an adult, then you try and learn how to do a handstand. That's that. But there's a, there's a lot of people that um, yeah that gravitate towards that, and you know some of the initiatives you guys are doing around like putting on sessions for non you know for adults that just want to come recreationally and enjoy some of the benefits of circus skills. We can talk. We'll get delve into that. I just think is yeah, it's 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 a great it's a great thing. Um, sorry, yeah. I just sort of stopped doing tracks a little bit. No, no, but I think that's really important. And I think what I think is interesting, I think there's a sort of a thought at some point that we grow out and stuff like that. And, you know, we stop, we stop rolling and we stop wanting to hang and we stop wanting to do handstands and cartwheels. But actually, I don't, I actually think, you know, if you go right back into our inner cells, we, we, we love that stuff, yeah. you know? You've got, you've got that room at the circus place where it's like a spring, sprung floor, sprung walls, and there's just like, bounce the things to bounce like you just run in there and that like, you can see versus adult, everyone stood there and as an adult you do an adult thing of like you, you're waiting for someone else to do it to make sure that then it's okay but you just want to go well someone like me you just want to go bonkers just mess about on it and um giving yeah. you the freedom to do that like you say as a as an adult it's it's refreshing because it's so different to what we're supposed to do as adults that's right. And then, uh, unfortunately, because, you know, for whatever reason, and, and look, I, I sometimes give gymnastics a bit of a hard time, and I actually think the sport itself is evolving. There's many elements to it now. It's not all about becoming an Olympian. But there tends to be a sort of a um, selection for the best sort of approach that they weed out through all the recreational kids, those that have the potential to go on and be competitors, which, which is fine for, for making sport of gymnastics. But I think then we tend to sort of lose some of that just doing it for fun element because actually you're not seen as being successful. So you, you move on to something else. Yeah. And then you have this, this gap from the age of about 12 years old where most people sort of think about dropping out of gymnastics. And then maybe, you know, now that the, the world is offering all this sort of stuff, but you go, God, it's been 20 years since I've done it. And then you've got the fear problem and you know, I haven't been loading my wrist for 20 years. So all the stuff is painful. <laughs> So there's these big hurdles to overcome when you get back into it as an adult, although inside the love of it is there. Like you say, it's, it's we want to throw ourselves around and we just want to make sure we're okay when we land. Yeah. Um, and then so your your role at the National Circus now, and how long have you been there? Yeah, so I sort of started just as a freelance teacher doing a bit of teaching. And, and again, really, um, it's been a massive learning curve for me. Like I... Um, you know, went in with the knowledge I had from gymnastics, which is a certain amount of that was transferable to the circus world, but really lacking so much of the stuff that circus artists um, uh, need, like that, that real playful element. Like I say, thank, thankfully there was that exposure I had to the kids and the fun side of it. Yeah. Um, certainly the sport of gymnastics doesn't really help that much actually with, with trying to create artists, although you can sort of go on and be the clinician. And as long as that's supported by other teachers that are more creative than I was, that sort of you get away with it. Yeah. But over the years, I've sort of, um, you know, spent trying to learn new disciplines and you know, branch off from what I knew from gymnastics and pick up the, the sort of the, the multitude of disciplines there are in circus and really have to thank a lot of the people that supported me along the way and, you know, and the students and the um, young people that said, okay, this guy doesn't know what he's doing, but we'll give him a chance. And then, you know, eventually you, you sort of evolve your practice. Um, so, you know, it's been a good 20 years. Um, cause my role currently is less about teaching and more sort of thinking about how we teach circus and teaching teachers and trying to um, support the teachers and that same growth that I went through that took me 20 years, can, can we sort of speed that up with a bit of support so that happens a bit quicker? So, yeah. so I have less contact with the students uh, uh, these days, but I'm still trying to, you know, master my skills of teaching teachers and learning about that as we go. Yeah, yeah. And I imagine there's, yeah, coach, coaching the coaches in, 
the, 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 the circus environment almost because there is an element of that creativity you said that I imagine that the rules are just the more rules you have the less likely someone is to be creative if that makes sense absolutely you know I mean that that's one of the challenges I think we have um certainly as we try and get this sort of this precision high level, like, you know, most people, if you think as an audience member, you want to see good stuff, right? And yeah. the more specialized and high level that you get, it's actually harder and harder to keep that creativity because there's laws of biomechanics and gravity that apply to any athlete. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, it's trying to balance that. You still want the high uh, technical skill level, but actually allow that to be, playful so you don't look like every other circus artist where you know there's a lot of athletes that start looking a lot like the other athletes because they're narrowing that skill into competing against people that look exactly like them whereas as as an entertainment or an art form you, you want to keep that individuality so you've got to keep that sort of horizontal expansion rather than just the vertical side so it's a, it's a bit of a balance because you can't just deny all the sports science and all the learning stuff that we know about repetition and precision and it does take time to master some of these skills yeah but if you get too, if you get too locked into that you give up a lot of the other opportunities around individuality and originality so yeah. it's, it's, it's a bit balanced yeah well we're gonna we'll um want to talk a little bit about skill development we're we're sort of um we love talking about skill development particularly from that as you were saying like that adult point of view of you trying to then do something brand new we talk about redefining our impossible at the school of calisthenics because some of these things really do feel impossible some of them have like a great strength element depending on what it is but some of them things like your handstand have a much more um skill balance element um and we're gonna use um so juggling as a bit of a a tool to uh, you know when we went to oh, so you go to you go to visit these guys and actually and everywhere you go there's just juggling balls and the opportunity to just juggle and um i i found that there was a number of things that we had a conversation about the the benefits of juggling and what it can what it can give that i want to ask you about um in a second there was a story that you told us that i thought it would be nice to to open up that conversation with where there was someone learning to do the, the skill was a back um, a back tuck or back flip up running up a wall, and yeah. uh, learning it in a, in one environment and not being able to transfer it into the into the show. Like just just I thought that was I really loved that story that you told, and it just really sets the tone of like why it's important to have like a skill development process that allows those skills to be transferable to other environments but then also hopefully other skills so that we're broadening that skill set yeah and i think this sort of is an interesting um you know story that represents a few sort of uh things is that one of the things as adults is that we're quite impatient um yes. uh, yeah we set goals for ourselves and that's right i know we just want to get there right and any any sort of shortcuts or tricks or or anything that's what we're very hungry for for that information and and i think actually sort of you know when I, when I was, this, this story was, was um, a guy that was dancing and singing in the rain at the National Theatre. And, you know, was, he's an amazing athlete, super, like in tap dogs. And the guy was incredible, you know, real master and, and very athletic and very fit and very strong and very bouncy. He could jump. He had, all, he had all the elements there, right? So there, there's this one famous piece, obviously runs up the wall, back on top of the wall, and they needed that in the show. So they came to the National I went in there being super coach and, you know, just throwing all the knots, you know, and this is how you do in there, for, you know, giving him the quickest route from A to B. And a lot of that was me carrying him through the somersault, like building it into him, doing hundreds and hundreds until I could sort of start backing away, backing away, backing away. And then, well, he did it, like, super fast. Like I say, he had, he had this, you know, he had the capacity to learn because of his physicality. Yeah. Now, he, he, he looks satisfied, we've done the job, and then I went off. You, how quickly was that, though? I mean, we probably did maybe three, four sessions, you know, so it was, it was super quick. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and we probably could have done it in one if it wasn't for the fact that fatigue sets in, so we'd had to give him a rest, come back. So it probably took him like an hour or so, like it was nothing. Yeah. And, and then what was interesting, he went back into rehearsals and then sort of, um, you know, ready to open the show, and I got invited along to one of the dress runs. And he went in, was coming out to the big part, and he did it, and... Honestly, you know, it was one of those moments where I thought I'm about to watch someone break their neck on stage. Like, 
And he crashed to the ground and he said, oh, yeah, man, they're just deteriorating. It's getting worse and worse and worse. And what I realized, we'd missed this big piece of, of actually his knowledge, his understanding of this. He didn't know, not even, first of all, didn't know why it was going wrong, let alone now how do I fix it? Because I had taken all that away from him. I hadn't given him the opportunity to understand each step of the way so that he'd have a chance to modify his own practice. So it was this fast track. Yes, we felt like we'd done something, but I hadn't really given him any tools to go away and do anything else with that, you know. And then and eventually it got dropped, dropped out of the show. So that was my ego about wanting to be the super teacher, his impatience, and, and just uh, both being naive as to what was really required. And, of course, for me, it's like, you know, from someone from a gymnastic background, wow, it's years and years of practice. They must have this knowledge. But he didn't. It was a very superficial level of learning. So I think, you know, that, that's a really important lesson for all of us to yeah. take the time to the capacity so that we have options when things go wrong. Well, I guess that was potentially like quite a pivotal point in your career as a coach of what you, you know, what you learned through that process. Okay, okay, it wasn't a great outcome for him, but what that's, what you've then used and, you know, what I love about you as a coach is when we, you're such a humble guy, but like we've, we've, we've spoken a number of times at like levels of like, you know, you guys use a lot of um, like brain training techniques and things that we experienced when we were doing some of the work on the, the balance beam, some, some really like innovative, like different stuff. Um, we can get into some questions about um, different ways of, of creating new ranges of motion that isn't just standard stretching, which was what you first sort of came up against, uh, or, you know, passive static stretching. Um, but the... Um, that the uh, that that's that what you learn through that process allows you to then become a better a better coach and off the off the back of that shaped it's, it feels like shaped a little bit of like how you would go about like your work after that moving forward um, I mean we get so many questions people will be able to relate to this let us know in the comments because that often one of the first questions that someone asks when they interact with us about learning something is they go, and it's always, it's always a little bit of a, like an alarm bell when the question is, how long will it take me to do X? Yeah. And you're like, as it, but like, that's a really good example. Cause you go, well, well, it can be, it can be this long, but then you're actually only going to get this outcome. And it might not actually be in the longer term, the thing that you, the thing that you want. Um, you know, it was your conversations we had with you around, variation in hand balancing that gave us the the tools to be able to go let's let's have more variety in our training to build a more, more robust like technique so that you can go and do that anywhere that you want to rather than only on that one bit of ground at your house that you practice on um, mm. and just opened up that uh, yeah, that conversation, which has been yeah really beneficial to to a lot of people. Um, the skill. So the, the, before we go into the practical of uh, juggling as a skill, I remember you saying, give some context of it. It's like someone, it's rather than someone just being like, oh, juggling, juggling. Like yeah, that's just like moving moving some three balls around and trying to work out that coordination. I remember you talking about. Um, and it, it made me stop at the time. We'd only just met, so I didn't really want, I didn't like saying anything because I was challenging myself. You were saying basically like, you're, it's in a way, there's, there's a balance element to it that if I'm standing upright and I move my arm out to the side, that counterweight should make me fall over. But reflexively, something happens to maintain us in that position. And when we juggle, we're constantly moving. Yes, it's hand-eye coordination. I think everyone gets that. But there's this whole other element that's going on um, in the background. It's almost this like subconscious thing. Um, but that was one of the things that I picked up from you about juggling. Is there anything else? Or just like explain that a little bit and anything else around juggling that, um, you know, you talked about as breaks to freshen the mind up from when you're working and those types of things. Any other benefits of juggling before we get into doing it? Well, I think, I think that's a really good point is that we, we tend to look at this stuff that's impressive. And, you know, when you think about balancing, you think of, okay, upside down hand balancing. Can I walk on a tight wire? Can I, you know, be on tippy toes as a ballerina? All these things that are really high level balance. And, of course, we recognize that. But we forget that just sitting even on the floor is balancing. You know, even the ability to sit and not have your head, like there has to be some level of 
control just for posture, you know. Yeah. So your body is working really hard to deal with all of that. And then as you start putting motion or moving your arms or doing tasks at the same time as staying upright, I mean, there's, there's this complex mechanism that's far beyond anything we can really learn because it's yeah. so it's so reactive. It's reactive. And so I think, you know, the problem with circus sometimes as well, a bit like gymnastics, is it can be really out of out of reach for most people. They're like, well, you know, again, I didn't start when I was young. I've never done There's no way. I've got poor balance. And actually, if we can bring back in and say, well, just, you know, standing and standing on one foot and then standing on one foot and throwing and catching a ball, it's incredible for balance, you know, and that, that may be a bit underwhelming for people, but then there's all this scalable, you know, and then can you cover one arm and can you catch behind your back? And so you can play with the originality of the fun. Well, this is cool. Throwing and catching a ball can I do something that's a bit of a party trick, but actually the complexity of it, I'm there as a, I'm, I'm pretty nifty at this stuff, versus also the hand coordination, the brain switching on, as we, we, we know, you know, just getting the eye working coordination with the hand means the brain is having to work. And the whole thing you can bundle up and it's very scalable and accessible to people that are just rehabbing or haven't done any sort of physical activity at all, right through to you know, high level, wow, you can do this at an extreme level. But And that's what I think is lovely about what juggling. Like, I'm not a juggler by any stretch, um, but I'm really seeing that I can access juggling or the idea of a juggling ball to make the boring stuff more, um, you know, you can layer in the complexity to make it more of a sort of a skill learning and development and progression than what we may have thought. And actually today we're going to look at some stuff with one ball. It's not... It's not juggling, not doing three balls, which everyone thinks is the beginning. Three balls, then you go four, five, six, seven, eight. Where today we're going to look at stuff with just one. And, and you know, it's, I can't yeah. Three. What I'd recommend, like, the tricky thing is, if you've got a tennis ball, yeah, they um, you can throw catch, but then you're going to have trouble with some of the stuff where we might want to balance it. Uh, okay. Yeah. You've got to be really good if you can manage. Happy sunshine. You're great. You're great. <laughs> if you don't have a juggling ball, roll up some socks. And we can do that as well. And these are really nice. And the good thing about them is that they don't break too many things if they bounce around your house. Okay, so that's the thing. A lot of the stuff we develop for also being at home. Yes. You know, we're going to have the high ceilings that jugglers would need. But we're going to play around and see if we can, you know, start showing that we can add challenges that can be work, can be great as a warm up, can be great, uh, you know, as just having fun. But also we can see um, improvements in range of emotions and all sorts, sorts of other things. So, yeah, yeah hopefully it feels like they're Let's, um, I'm just going to give, I've got like one question for you that will have to give people time to take you, if you either get a ball, if you've got a juggling ball, great. But then if you haven't, take your socks off, make sure they're not white, boring socks. Uh, take, your, take your socks off, roll them up, in, uh, put them up into a ball and get yourself ready. Um, and then I would just give, us, give people one minute to do that to get ready. Um, I notice that if I do some juggling before I try and do my mo any more like complex handstand work, my handstand is better. Yeah. And just for people to try, like for people to just, that might be a bit of like a bit of a, whoa, like what? Like can just give a little bit of rationale as to why that might be why that might be happening. Why is that juggling potentially sort of firing up my brain to do a more complex task? Yeah. So, so again, look, I'm sure there's neurologists out there that can probably um, you know, either say that I'm saying this wrong or can describe it much better than. I'm. But yeah, but the the idea is that like the base of our brain, the cerebellum, which is is primarily involved with um, quality of movement and posture and coordination, mostly uh, stays switched off because it's a very hungry, energy-hungry part of our brain. So it makes sense that it stays off whenever it can do, because if it was on the whole time, we wouldn't be able to do anything except eat. Like, we just need so much energy for that. So that's really make makes sense. So that means we can go about our day walking and doing daily, daily tasks without it switching on. But that also means we're relying on having um, those skills quite well nailed down. But what is important is that when we try and when we add a little bit of complexity, you'll get that cerebellum turning on. And when that's turned on, and because it's in charge of that posture, movement control, and all those, we, we get an increase in function. And then when we're using our hands, we're talking about proprioception, you know, movement, hand-eye coordination. All of this is now just building this body map, which our brain needs to be activated through these things like sensation and movement and coordination. 
So then I think, you know, any skill that you then go and do while you're in that window of being sort of everything sort of switched on, you have an enhanced learning opportunity, I think. Do you think, yeah. has anyone, have you come across anyone learn, uh, using it in, um, using that or other types of sort of brain stimulation as part of warm-ups in like, in sports that require I I, I, you know, like this whole neurology movement, obviously, as you know, through see, see health and places like that, you know, they're really sort of taking that neurology, which used to be pretty much around, um, you know, brain dysfunction uh, in psychology, and now it's becoming into, into human performance, and they're really unlocking uh, so much of, of what we can do. And yes, whether it's there's a quick warm up, get the brain switched on. I mean, we see so many um, really weird injuries happening in, in warm ups, and that's because mostly we're just not paying attention. There's no need because we're asking people to do very mundane, very boring stuff. So we see them just, just doing the motion and there's no need to be alert. But, you know, as soon as you put someone on a cobbled street, boom, they are, you know, all of a sudden they're paying attention, you know, and because they know they need to ask, they're going to get injured. Yeah. By adding in some of the complexity, whether it's a juggling or, a, you know, a coordination task or, or anything, or even saying doing mathematics, as we've talked about, yeah. you have to engage the brain and then the rest of the body benefits from, you know, the, the, the watchtower and uh, being fully manned. So, yeah. Cool. Right. So let's, uh, let's, let's, I'm going to, we're going to stand up presumably. Yes. We're going to stand up. I don't know. Hopefully you can see me. I've got a few. Yeah. There's going to be parts. Tell me if I need to move my camera. So one of the things I think is interesting with this, and this is for people to do for themselves is that you, we've got to try and find a way of helping people to see whether this is working or not. I mean, you could just believe in and just do it. And it could be fun and there could be a reason just to do it for that. But we want to see are there other benefits beyond just entertaining someone. So one of the things that I think you guys have talked about is what can we use to buy with feedback? Okay. Um, and one of the things we know, and the easy one to measure is uh, uh, range of motion. So I'd ask anyone watching now to just spend 30 seconds playing around with range of motion. So whether it's like a straight-legged reach, internal rotation, uh, or thoracic rotation, just things to get, get a sense of how that feels for you. Do it a few times so it doesn't just get better because we're warming up. And then remember how that feels. We'll try yeah, some of the toe touch here. How's that going with you at the moment? Uh, it's good when I focus on it. I've been sat down all day doing podcasts, so it's a little bit tight. Great. It makes a difference. So, and what we want to do is we want to run some of these drills and just for your own sake. Like, te keep testing your ranges of motion after each of these things. And you may say, it makes no difference. And then there's a whole reason for that. And I'm not pretending that it's going to work for everybody. But it might be interesting that you see some people go, oh, my God, how come I can now reach further to the floor just because I've been mucking around with a juggling ball? So yeah. give yourself some um, biofeedback. Bio and then you build a vocabulary what works for you. And then it's a great thing to use as a warm-up drill or, you know. And actually, if it's... If it, Maggie, um, Maggie you know, is saying uh, a there was a Formula One driver. She can't remember who it is that juggles before racing. It, that it makes sense in ties in what you're saying. JD oh, Jones bro. has got a Satsuma instead of uh, juggling ball. I've actually got um, a Kiwi, and that might be yeah. that might be better for my yeah. See, there you go. I'm gonna use Great. Okay. So you can use use something. Find some sort of uh, find some some sort of something you can throw and catch. So what I'm going to do is just run through a bunch of stuff, and I'm not really going to necessarily make it have any sort of continual sense to it, but ideas that people can play with to show that, that it goes in all sorts of directions. And like I say, everyone, everyone, any time you want, test and retest and see this works for me, you may find it makes it worse for you. And then that's an interesting thing to then use as feedback, going, I probably need to work on that because my body doesn't like it. So if you're, we're start if you're very, very confident, you could use an egg. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> a baby even. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay, so we're going to start with a juggling ball in the palm of the hand. Okay, and we're just standing, and we're just seeing if you can pat the ball up and down. And we have a bruised kiwi. <laughs> Good. And then can you switch to the other hand? Good. Now most people are probably going to be relatively comfortable with that. This is quite good stuff for teaching kids how to catch. You know, oh, the motor skill. Have the kiwi, yeah, poor kiwi. It's definitely going to be kiwi juice by the end. So already, again, people can do that. But what we want to do is find that point where it's challenging but not completely impossible. So that's we want to keep scaling it up a little bit, see if you can find – you might find that for yourself or for, for clients that you're working with, that's good enough. And actually, that there's a lot of balance practice just going on there, okay? It's a pretty good skill for people to do. 
already just see if you want to retest. Does anybody have anyone noticed just from doing like twenty repetitions on each hand? Did they find? Yeah. Any- my my toe touch my toe touch is better. Literally just after that. Great. So let's scale it up a bit. Now we do palm up for one hit, palm down for one hit. So you're going to flip flip flop the hand. Okay, and already we know this is a drill they use for neurological testing, you know, like how well can someone make this action. Yeah. So we're combining a neurological drill with a jumping ball. So flipping, flopping back and forth. And then switch hands and you'll probably find you've got one hand, obviously, that feels a little more comfortable than the other. Great. Okay, level three. So you're going to scale it right now. Retest again. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you went so far down, you went out of shot. It was amazing. <laughs> okay, next one, we're going to palm up, palm down, fist punch. So one, two, three. One, two, three. And so you've got to, there's a sequence now you need oh. to remember. There's a courtyard, and it gets a little challenging. So, again, see how you're doing, and can you get about 20 repetitions, and then switch hands, and how successful it will be. Good. And then all, all of this stuff you can take onto standing on one foot. Like, so straight away, you can scale up to one foot and you'll really see the balance that goes on when you've got this complex movement pattern happening on with the coordination, with remembering the sequence, and trying to balance on one leg. So, you know, have a go at doing it on one foot and then see if that really switches up the, the biofeedback into a positive place. So right. you can ask people to play around with... Different leg position could be forward, could be out the side, could be to the back. So you can scale it to everyone's point where they go, now I'm struggling, but it's working. And so we want to find that sweet spot. I found so try. Point. Yeah. And the thing is that people can get really good at it, and then you need to mix it up again. You want to keep moving the goalposts so they're working in that sort of just out of that comfort zone. And see what we get with that. Good. And then, again, go back and retest. So it's always – is this a good thing for me? If it's not, well, I can chuck it in the bin, and if it's great, then I can put it in my back pocket and use it when I want to, you know, pre-training. I'm now having not stretched. I'm not doing. I'm just, just my retest is t- trying to touch my toes because I was tired from having sat that up. I, I was. I could touch my toes just my fingertip on the floor, whereas now, after what five minutes of no stretching and just this, I, my palms nearly flat on the floor. I mean, it's, it's, it's cool, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's, yeah. it's really cool stuff. Really great, really great. Okay, so another one that's similar idea, and again, you know, this is just so there's a bit of variety in it, is to try and um, hand on top of the ball, and can you open the hand completely and keep the ball afloat? Okay, and we want to see then, can we touch touch your own shoulder? So the same shoulder as the hand you're using, What? go back to the ball. Whoa! Good. Can we have the other hand on standby here and clap and go for the ball? And the good thing is that they are babies, so if you do drop them, it's completely fine. That's a good thing. <laughs> the other thing is, this is just fun. That's the other thing. Yeah. And then try the other hand. My good. left hand's not going to be the camera. Then they can can alternate left and right. We can take that down by squat all the way down to the floor. Okay, if you have a second of it. But now it makes you, you know, like things you can just do automatically. And when you give us something, a new task to do that isn't, doesn't feel automatic, it feels so weird. Like I'm thinking there, I'm thinking so much about, like my hand is like, I want to, I want to clap before I let go and, it just doesn't, because it, it just feels so un, unnatural. It's like really challenging. My, I can literally feel like the cogs turning in my head and then, and then you get in a rhythm and then, it, and then it feels like, oh, okay, I'm making progress here. Like I can feel the difference. Whereas watching you do it, because you've obviously done them before, you've got that pattern, you've got that skill development and you just, and you just can just transfer it to whatever thing you're going to do. And it makes you initially think, I'm just going to do it. And then you're like, it's like before you do it, your brain is thinking and it's, and it's too slow, I think is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, and I think it's probably where it's most powerful, you know, when you really have to work on it. And so, and what I want people to do is like, this stuff is just made up. This, this isn't, um, you know, there's no more 
uh, benefit from one exercise to the next unless it benefits you more than the other one. And that's the thing. You want to just relate it to your own personal uh, level. And so another one you can do if we're doing this, if we're going back to the claw catch one from left to right, if you've got another object, so the, for me the red and white ball is going to be the one that I keep changing. The other one I'm going to keep in one hand. But if I want to swap hands, I'm also going to have to swap the other ball. You what? So I've got one hand just doing this. But because I've got the other object in the hand, when I want it, when I let go of this one, I have to get rid of that one. So the same ball stays in front, and the right. kiwi goes back and forth yeah, between the. Yeah, we might be having kiwi juice. So I don't know. Yeah. So see, like my brain's like, what? Yeah. <laughs> ah! Right. <laughs> this is now one of those things that this isn't finishing. This live isn't finishing until I've done this. Right, so I'm gonna... Is that right? Yeah, I, I can't quite see that right. You're a little bit out of shot with your hands, but I can sort of hear, hear the thumping on the ground, so I know you're still dropping. <laughs> yeah, the thumping means I'm definitely dropping it. Right. So, um, um, that, that's fine. That's perfect. Right. Kiwi. Kiwi's going to come across. Whoa, you got a ninja. Right. That's amazing. Ah! I'm sorry, I need to work on this. I need to work on it. I love it. Cool, great. Okay, and then we've been um, playing around a little bit with uh, some range of motion stuff. So taking the, the ball or the kiwi or the sock, if you put it, if you think about going to full shoulder flexion and then in, uh, sorry, external rotation, so we're going to have the ball off the back. This is great stuff for handstands as well. Then we're thinking thoracic extension, so just opening up here. The opposite hand is going to go into extension and internal rotation. And I'm going to see if I can drop the ball from the top into the hand at the bottom. Crikey. Oh, in touch. Right. Yeah. And actually just running through that a few times of going back and forth is that I'm really exploring some interesting ranges of motion. And this is tough for me. I'm rubbish at this internal rotation extension bit. And then yeah. my thoracic extension is pretty rubbish. So this is a quite, I really enjoy this, and it's got a bit of a fun element to it as well. Good. That's not working for me. That Combine that. Well. You should have prepped me. I didn't know we were doing this one. So I would drop the back. I would drop the back hand down a bit, so it's maybe down by your belt line. So not up here. Straighter, oh, straighter. Right. Yeah, straighter arm. Lower down. Ooh, here we go. Maybe. <laughs> There's no one there. There you go. I think you've got some of the sort of uh, extension problems that I have. Oh. Good. Yeah. Brilliant. So if you want to throw a little um, throw into that. So if you start with your hand up, think about keeping your arms stuck to your head. Put the hand down like a shower head or a giraffe's head or whatever. You're going to take the ball, you're going to look up at this hand, and you're just going to throw and throw up into your hand. Okay, so try and think about it coming in underneath rather than going up and then you're catching it. But boom, once you catch it, then you can go into our drop down the back. Can you go ahead and get it? Yeah, that's hard. Again. Boom, behind the back. I think one of the things I like about these, Glenn, is we talk about, um, or we talk about, because a lot of people talk about it because it's, it's true, giving the brain a reason to have the range of motion that you're after is one surefire way of like the brain letting you have that range. So the more to, I've joked before at like a workshop saying, if I spent, or rather than spending all day on my computer like this, I spent all day walking around like this, then the chances are my brain would be happier with me being in that yeah. shoulder flexion position. So like just yeah. little fun things like this is giving me Ah, and then, then switch sides and go the other way. Boom, boom. My throwing is a bit of a problem. Fantastic. Throwing it too far. I'm not throwing it up. You know, like you were saying like up to the hand. I'm throwing it 
forward and then like catching it. Yeah, but the good thing is you can get some feedback. Like every time it misses, you think, okay, it was to the left, I need to go a bit to the right, or it was too high or too low, and you can just use that as feedback. So I think that's a really good point that the other thing that we're doing on this is that give yourself a reason to do it, and we'll go into a little bit more. Yeah, I'm getting back. think can uh if we lost glad can people still hear me is it glenn's connection can you still hear me we'll try and get glenn back in um let me know in the comments is it can you still hear me is the connection okay um Yeah, okay, yeah, sorry, we're getting him, he's coming back in. Just a potential Wi Fi connection. Back. There we go, you're back. Cool. Okay, should we now, maybe now look at some stuff that's a bit more juggly related. We're going to look at taking the ball in the right hand, we're going to pass it behind our back and throw it over our left shoulder to catch in the left hand. So around, over the left shoulder. Great, right. just alternating from one side to the other. And again, any of this stuff, as soon as you add it to one leg, onto one leg, you've got a much more uh, intense balance challenge to be going on. So what we tend to do, we've seen for so long, this whole thing about wobble boards and all sorts of things of removing a stable surface, and we think we're training our balance. Actually, we're better off training balance with a stable surface by adding movement capacity from our from our body. So you know, standing on one foot and doing these tasks of throwing and catching is a far better balance training skill than standing on a wobble board. Well, I think I'm thinking of the, any of these ones where you're going extension, internal rotation, for thinking about a ring muscle up, for example, how many people lack that shoulder extension and that good internal rotation? And some of these things where we're just getting used to being in those shapes in a yeah. completely different and novel way. Um, uh, it's going to be beneficial for your range of motion and, and access to it. The um, Timad um, Oli Frost, uh, the movement mobility specialist, on this morning, and one of the thing I caught the, one of the conversations they had. And one of the things that um, Oli said was he, do he doesn't have this as part of his thing, but one of the things he did say was having as many different like inputs to the joint as possible. So as many different reasons and varieties for it to move is going to help nurture it or nourish it with the nutrients that it needs. So this is just another variation of you're going to go into extension, internal rotation because the output I'm asking you to do is throw the ball over that shoulder. Um, and the fact that it's spun. Oh, like, like a thing with is that we have this intention of throwing it over our shoulder, and the first time we try it, it, we, it just goes. You know? so basically, as soon as we get into this position, neurologically we're blind. Like it, Our arm disappears as far as our brain's concerned. So the fact that it's so misaligned with what we think we're doing and what we are doing has got to be something that um, gives us a bit of feedback that there's a problem. And if we've got uh, any sort of anxiety around having lack of control of a position, it's going to create tension, you know. Our brain is going to say, if I don't know where my arm is in space, I'm going to lock this joint up to try and protect it. So really interesting, once we start managing to master these skills, it means we're mastering positional awareness. And yeah. once we master that, we can access greater ranges of motion because there's less threat of injury. So I think, you know, again, how, how you look at this, there's benefits in it all. Um, you know, and it's just a fun way to pass the time. And you'd be surprised. It's really weird. The thing with juggling, it's like, this is like, I don't know, 100 grams of weight. And yet you can play it for one and you can end up sweating, you know, because yeah. there's a lot of energy stuff going on. So it's, it's definitely a worthwhile warm-up activity, if nothing else. And interesting, I think, also a really good break from intensity, you know. Like uh, I sort of find if we've got someone working at really high intensity levels, they need a little bit just go and do some simple throwing and catching and just thinking, you know, if we can – you know, keep the brain on, allowing the body to uh, sort of rest a little bit. Yeah. it's. Uh, I love the way 
the, the explanation you gave there at the end was like perfect around why that, or to me, it's a sound effect that is as in like it really struck a chord that when you're, when you, when you've lost that positional awareness, the brain is going to want to tighten up the joint out of our out of protection. Um, and that gives some really good rationale to me as to why some of these things are going to be beneficial as part of that, um, part of that movement sort of input that you're giving your, your joints and your brain as, you know, people are asking about using it in warm ups. Like that's, that's totally what we're, you're talking about moving the joint, getting positional awareness. Um, you're talking about hand eye coordination. You're talking about firing up the brain and it's fun. Well, that ticks like five different things that are all going to be beneficial as, um, as part of, uh, as part of warp and, I think someone else asked, like, could it be, could it be something you do as part of a morning routine? Um, I'm assuming the answer would be yes. Like, if that's, if that's where it fits into the day for you, there's no reason why it couldn't be um, a two-minute break, getting out of your chair from if you're working at a desk or whatever it is, just to give yourself a physical and mental break from work. I'm assuming as well. That type. Yeah. Of thing. No, exactly. And and I think, you know, what is interesting that you've given a really good example, which I haven't even really thought about, is this, you know, muscle up position, this, you know, shoulder extension. I mean, so many people need that because they want to learn a muscle up. So how do we, you know, emulate that position, uh, un, you know, without the load, but, you know, increase the awareness around that range. So finding something. So you could be doing some stuff, much more stuff above the head. Like this is great for handstand training, you know, this yeah. drop because that's looking like our handstand position. So, you know, using it to sort of relate back to what we want to achieve. And, you know, we're choosing juggling, but it could be like, you could be trying to write your name on a piece of paper behind your back. You know, yeah. how, how well can you create precise movement in a position that you're, uh, you know, not that used to? That could be a way of unlocking that progress as well. And, you know, like I say, if your morning routine, if it becomes too easy, you need to keep moving the goalposts a little bit. Like, what's the next adaptation to make it challenging for you like it was when you first started? That, that, that principle of progressive overload that uh, transcends anything anyone's trying to ever do ever, ever. Just like, as soon as something becomes easy, just add like a small amount of additional complexity to keep that progression moving forward. The fun, one, one last thing for me on this is like, I... My shoulder feels a bit tight actually today in that position. I'm, I'm already aware of that. But for some reason, I've got the, um, the comfort. I'm right-handed, so throwing it off my right hand feels okay. The idea of my left feels easier there. doesn't feel as restricted today. But the idea of I don't dare throw it because I feel like it's going to go to the next door. Like I literally haven't dared do it with my left hand yeah. yet. It feels... I'll do one just to put it. So it threw it against my back like that. What you said of like that blind spot, I don't know. I've got no awareness of where my hand is when it's there. Feels there you go. Threw it at the camera. Feels exactly what it's what it's yeah. like. But as anything that feels awful when you first do it, I know I go and do a few minutes of this. That specific one. Any of that in like extension, internal rotation pattern. I know I'm going to get that. I can already feel that I'm going to get some benefit from that because I know yeah. it's so bad at the moment just from a, that coordination perspective rather than me just like, just, just sitting and stretching in that position or, okay, I know I've got like a little bit of, um, like feel a bit of like, like tightness that might, with a little bit of like self-massage, might ease off a little bit as well. But then giving myself some sort of task to do that's going to, want me to use that range and then go and train to get strong in that range well then i've give talk about different inputs into the joint i've i've given it some freedom i've given it a reason to it and then i've built strength through it yeah and then you're thinking the brain's adaptation it's going to be easier for my brain to maintain that tomorrow and the next day when i go and then challenge it again rather than it wanting to revert back to where it was before because it's trying to make like the brain is trying to make life easier for you. So it adapts in that way because if you get a good challenge, it's going to want to then be better at that. So it fits in really nicely rather than, you know, if you look at it like from a, say someone just joined now, it's like, oh, what are you doing? You're juggling. Oh, what's that about? Like, where does it fit into that conversation? Well, it fits right. It, when you talk about it in that context, it fits perfectly in the middle. Um, whereas at first glance, without the context, it's like, 
Oh, what's driven got to do with this? Yeah, what's that? exactly, exactly. You know, so and and again, it's it, this is a great tool, but actually, it could be a variation. You come over the same shoulder rather than crossing the body. Like, you play around with different ideas, uh, or or going even just doing some stuff you're throwing under one leg, and then can you throw over one shoulder and catch under one leg, and you can start playing. It's endless, yeah, it's absolutely yeah. endless. And you're asking people like, okay, how's your hip mobility? You know, how's your balance on one foot? How's your, you know, all the things here you can play with. And yeah, we're just using juggling, but you know, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, that, that play. And you know, again, one of the things that we're looking at is doing some of the more um, taking the static stretching ideas and adding this as a task. So I don't know how much time you've got. We probably need to jump off, but you know, sitting on the floor and say, okay, place the ball out with one hand and then go get it with the other hand. So, you know, sitting in your straight-legged pike stretch, yeah. but playing around with placing the ball or bouncing two balls on top of each other, so you've got these tasks to do. And, of course, yes, you're going into ranges of motion that would normally be a stretch, but you're doing it because you've got a job to do, not because yeah. you're here to get long hand strings. Yeah, you know? so but I think that's, that's a key. There's two key things there that you've, you've, you've touched on. One is the creativity that be creative and like find different ways, but do it as a problem solving thing. So if you want to work on like there, you went like, what if you went under one leg? And I was like, oh. but then you went, because it might be, if you're trying to create external rotation at the, at the hip, you do that as part of that task to create space to get under there. You can match the task to the range of motion that you're trying to create. And the fact that it's task based, is like a different input or a different impulse that you're asking the brain to do rather than purely go into this end position. Yeah. We've played around with stuff again, like, okay, drop the ball, drop the ball on the ground, look at it, then close your eyes and go and get it, right? It's just a, this thing about, you know, how well can you remember positions in space? But then if you throw it a little bit further away and then look at it, you're going to have to take a step and reach, which yeah. looks a lot like preparation for a handstand. Right, so you're okay, you're yeah, step, yeah. stepping and placing your hands towards the ground, and if you can control that movement with your eyes closed, it, it makes sense to me that when you've got your eyes open, you're thinking about a handstand. You're well, I've, at least I've got the control I need going in, you know, yeah. before I'm just tackling the handstand. I, I can build up some capacity in my lunge ability, and it you know, ranges the motion and control and all that sort of stuff. So you just add some silly little task, and it's easy with juggling because it's a thing. But anything can, can work, you know. So. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah, no, like you say, the, the juggling just adds, it's, well, juggling, or it's, a, it's a catching task, but it's just, it's a task, you know, as you said, it could be, um, you, said, you gave one example, it could be writing your name behind your back or whatever it may be. I think the, the, the thing about the, the ball brings in the hand-eye coordination, which I think is beneficial, but, and it's, 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 it's super accessible and super versatile because you can yeah. sort of, you can think of anything in terms of throwing that ball and you can, you can do it really quickly, really easily anyway. And, no, and you and I, we've played around with eye drills and stuff, but if you, know, if you can just think about throwing and catching and you've got two objects and you can just, you're doing eye drills straight away, yeah. uh, you know, so you can, you can take benefit of all these other things we know yeah. without having to explain to people, why am I doing an eye drill? Like, you, you, just because you're juggling, you're going to be doing it. You know? I, and I'm, I know what I'm like. I'm going to do the juggling I'm not going to do the eye drills on their own as an eye drill on its own. It's too, it's, it's just, it's just not exciting enough for me. And like that might be, that's a flaw on my part because training your eyes is a good thing. But if I'm going to try, if I can train my eyes whilst doing that, well then that's something that I can buy into and want to do. Yeah. Because so it, it comes down to adherence and being consistent with stuff. The more times we, the more regular we do things, the, the more benefit you're going to have of it. And you need to, we all need to find things that we like doing and we're going to be consistent at doing for it to have its benefit rather than going, this one thing over here, that's the, that's the right thing to do. But if, if it's not something that you get excited about doing and you are going to do consistently, it's not the right thing for you. So we need to, that's, that's, a, that's a conversation I'm pretty, I'm, I'm passionate about having. And it's something that's come up with a few of the other uh, conversations throughout the day about understanding ourselves, understanding what works for us and finding the right things that work for us. Um, yeah. And what, what I'm finding is like, it's, it's going for that, that non-athletic population, you know, like even some elderly. And we know one of the big things is can you get down and back up off the floor? And actually, can you do it throwing and catching, which means you've got one hand taken out of the equation. So you've only got one. And actually, can you, can you keep doing it? Can you get down to the floor without using your hands and getting back up? And actually, for most adults, that becomes a, a challenge. 
you know, and then they've got people that can juggle three quite comfortably and they can try and figure out getting down to the floor and back up. So we've got some of these life skills that are actually really important. And he's just disguising it and like, hey, here's a, ch- here's a challenge for you, you know, and, and it, so yeah, it's nice spice up the boring stuff a little bit, you know, even though it's probably essential, you know, just add some fun element and, and I think we can break through some of that tedium. Something yeah. Like. Well, it, it, it feels yeah, we, we need to wrap things, we'll get cut off after uh, it only allows 60 minutes, but um, it makes me, uh, it makes more, the thing that I've, my mind jumps to is how, how simple, how accessible and how easy those things are look to do it's not intimidating to do some of those things and when we're thinking about longevity of our bodies and being able to use them and there you talk about getting being able to get up and down off the ground i was 38 this year that's not one of my necessary concerns right now but the the idea of going like will i be able to do a human flag when i'm 80 like maybe not the idea of you've got to train this hard until you're 80 to manage to do something like that you go well is that beneficial for you? Whereas all of this stuff you've, we've just shown there, if that's part of my routine, part of my warm up, and just part of something that I do, and you can you can you can totally imagine being able to like throw and catch some balls behind your back when when you're 80, like that doesn't feel intimidating at all. So, in terms yeah. of the in terms of the longevity question or conversation, it's yeah, it's a massive benefit. There's a lot of people saying. Um, a lot of uh, a lot of good things about uh, already feeling the benefits. Thank you for this live. Uh, someone, I think, when they said "big ass," I'm assuming it means that their ball was hitting their bum when they were trying to throw it behind behind their back. Don't worry, I had that I had that same problem as well. Um, but uh, yeah, thank you so much, Glenn, for uh, taking the time out of your day to join us for today's live. Um, I know that I've. Definitely. Every time I've had a session with you, I've been inspired to incorporate more stuff back in. But like anything, sometimes stuff slips. and I've not done that much juggling for a while. But the uh, there's a few of those ones, particularly that behind the back, that shoulder extension, internal rotation. There's going to be some stuff there. I'm gonna I'm gonna play with and uh, yeah, because I feel the benefit already, literally. No, oh, great. Well, let's know if you come with the other ideas. Share them. So that it's uh, it's cool. Yeah. No, it's been a, it's been a pleasure, man. Always great to talk to you. Thank you so much. Thanks, mate. Okay.